And we'll go ahead and convene this meeting. The meeting of the Rotary Club of Salem hereby is in order and we will um, join together for the Pledge of Allegiance. Are you ready, Brenna? Here comes the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, visible, liberty, and justice for all. Thank you. Brenna is going to take all of the microphones except mine to mute, so we'll take care of all the background noise, and you don't have to be concerned about that. So I'm going to mute everybody for a minute and give you guys a couple of instructions. If you've been here before, this is old news for you. Um, but if if you um, come across a question during our Q&A for our speaker, or if you want to do a bell ringer from the floor or have an announcement, I want you to navigate your way, click on participants in the, in the screen, with kind of the place you have at the bottom. Click on that and you'll find something that says raise hand. And when you click that, a little blue hand will come up under the list of participants. I will see that and unmute you as appropriate. So that is the, the way we do this. And Tammy, take it away. Okay, thank you, Brenna. Thank you for being my sidekick. Uh, if you happen to club members read the e-blast this week, uh, you know that I give a loud shout out to our IT support. So thank you to Brenna for that. Next week, Nick Williams has offered to step in so that Brenna can then take a position and be an attendee rather than offering tech support. Hopefully we'll be back to face-to-face -face meetings in the next month or so, but until then we'll go ahead and convene so we at least can keep track of one another. So thank you, Brenna, publicly for uh, taking on this duty uh, while we're in this space. So thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to be sure also so that you, if you didn't read the e-blast, we are tracking attendance. We have done our best to keep track of you. The last two meetings, we had 51 participants the first time, and last week we reached 74. So now today we're at 81 and we're tracking attendance. Holly is capturing everyone as you log in. Uh, Holly has asked me to say out loud, if you ha are using someone else's computer or if you are um, have some sort of uh, name that we might not recognize or uh, abbreviation um, to your login. If you could change it just for the purposes of the meeting so she can identify you as a Rotary member, that would be super helpful. Uh, if that's not possible, just send Holly a text and let her know that you were participating in the meeting. We are recording today's meeting. Uh, so remember, we can see you. Uh, and so we're recording it. It's going to go out there to the cloud and we're going to post it on YouTube and uh, post the meeting. And then anyone of our members, we have 184 members in our club. So anyone who's not able to join us during our live meeting will have the opportunity to go in and view the meeting post and record it as a makeup. So we're trying to cover all of our bases and be as inclusive and as intentional as we always are. Um, so if you know of someone who has not connected yet uh, via virtual meeting, but you know that they will have some interest, please make them aware uh, that we are recording the meetings and we will make them available after, afterwards so that they can record their makeup. I know several of our members take their attendance very seriously and we uh, uh, want to take that seriously in turn. So without any further delay, uh, we are coming up now on a piece of business for our invocation. So, Past President Bruce Anderson, you have the floor, sir. Okay, you can hear me okay? Yes, we can. No, oh, man, was this an was that an old time person question or what? Anyway, sorry. Um, all right, well, first, just greetings all. Uh, I've missed you all immensely, so uh, it's good to see all, us all, and what a great turnout, too. So that's awesome. Um, so please join me in prayer as your uh, faith dictates. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for Rotary and this time to gather as a club. We thank you for this technology that facilitates us all coming together uh, during these uncertain times in common purpose through Rotary. And I pray for our leaders as uh, they guide our local, state, and federal government in this uh, crisis. And we thank you for their service as well as the support of their families too at this time. 
I pray for wisdom and guidance for them all, um, as well as for President Tammy, our RI President, Mark, and all of our Rotary leaders. Bless our time together today, and Michael, as he uh, shares with us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thank you for that, Bruce. Okay. And now uh, we go to bell ringers. Rick Galpo, you have the floor, sir, and you can go ahead and introduce your guest at this time. As far as I understand it, Rick is the only one with guests to introduce. So Rick, this will be appropriate before bell ringers to introduce your guest, please. Great. Uh, I have a guest, um, Sayla. Sayla is um, on our team and she has the title of food resource developer, which really means she helps secure all the food that comes into the food share. And one of our great partners is Roth. So I asked her to join us for this call and this, this, uh, this, uh, so Sayla, I know you're on there somewhere. I can't see you right now, but thank you so much. And, um, hi Sayla. So welcome Sayla. Okay, great. Thank let's you. give Sayla, let's give Sayla these kinds of hands so that she knows that we're welcoming her. Okay, great. Thank you everyone. Okay, great. Rick, bell ringers, please. All right, we got we got three bell ringers, and then we have some. Um, we'll have some time for the floor from the floor. So the first bell ringer is is uh, Tim Murphy. Uh, Tim is ringing the bell for Steve Horning. Steve, you don't have to stand up. We're just going to presume you are. And uh, at Steve Horning and Willamette Community Bank. Uh, Steve is ringing the bell for Willamette Community B Bank for being there, working hard in support of local businesses in our community. Bridgeway loves you. Ring the bell. There you go, there's the bell. The second one is also from Tim Murphy. Tim is ringing the bell for the nurses, doctors, and staff at Bridgeway Recovery Services, who show up every day in a detox clinic, providing much needed medical care to a very vulnerable population and our neighbors and friends. Ring the bell. And then the last one that we have prepared is uh, John McCauley. Uh, John is ringing the bell for Russ McCracken uh, and his efforts to keep us informed about our centennial project, the Jerry Frank Salem Rotary Amphitheater. Leading the amphitheater huddles and writing the ampagram, Russ has worked hard to communicate important information with our club members. Ring the bell. So now we have some time to uh, have any bell ringers from the floor. Um, and Brenna's gonna help kind of track that. So if you just raise your hand if you need a, a bell ringer. Yep, Warren, go for it. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, a lot of you guys know that I cook and I sing and we do a lot of creative things. And one of the things that I do is I actually sew. So I've made some masks and at this point, I couldn't find elastic. So I went to Cook Stationery and bought some number, I think it's seven inch rubber bands. But since then, I've got this huge spool of elastic that came in. And if anybody needs, needs some elastic, because I know I had a hard time finding it, um, uh, just get a hold of me somehow, and I will give you some. The other thing, on the bridge of the mask, uh, you know what a folder or file holder, it holds the paper in when in your, in your file. I actually trim it down so it's smaller a little bit, and then that's, that's the nose piece that makes the, uh, the bridge of the nose so that it can contours to the face. So I have supplies. I have a whole bunch of these. I have a whole lot of this that I'll never use in my life. And if you want <laughs> some, just let me know. Ring the bell. Thank you, Warren. All right, we got one more from Allison Kelly. Go for it, Allison. You, I unmuted you, but you may also need to unmute you. How's that, better? Yep. Okay. Hi everybody, great to see you. I'd like to do a double bell ringer. Um, the first one is for our guest speaker, Michael Roth, who I ran into about a month ago, very early one morning helping a customer. And was just he's just such an amazing and impressive leader. So welcome, Michael, it's awesome to see you and thank you for, look forward to hearing what you have to say. And thank you for Roth's. Um, and then my second bell ringer is for all the staff members and volunteers um, at Liberty House. We are continuing to see a lot of kids and um, so I'm really glad that we've been allowed to be open. We have volunteers throughout the community who are sewing little masks for the children to wear when they come in for their exams. And so, you know, we're still doing exams, forensic interviews, medical checkups, and all 10 of our therapists are doing therapy via teletherapy. So 
just hats off to everybody who's leaning in with positive attitudes to really try to meet the needs of children in our community. So President Tammy, please ring the bell twice. Thank you. Okay, do we have one more? We do, Bruce, go for it. Hey, um, hi, thank you. Yeah, I um, appreciate Allison's bell ringer and I wanna kind of dovetail onto that as well and just uh, ring the bell for Michael Roth um, and Roth, his leadership uh, throughout Roth stores um, at this time. Uh, and it's mainly over the early precautionary uh, health uh, issues that uh, he implemented at all of his stores. Um, that was really made evident and made known to me by my wife when she had to stop by uh, one of our local stores here in Kaiser, and they don't observe certain health, uh, health issues as well as Roth has done. So just really wanted to uh, ring the bell for Michael Roth and uh, Roth's uh, Fresh Markets and really appreciate uh, all that you've done to help keep us all safe. Thank you. Ring the bell. Okay. Is that all of our bell ringers? That's it. Are there any others? Okay. Uh, thank you, Rick Gappo, for taking bell ringers, and thank you for the bell ringers from the floor today. We appreciate it. Uh, are there any other club announcements other than the ones I made as we uh, launched today's meeting? Um, Robin Kerner, uh, since we found out that we don't have everyone um, taking in every um, every bit of the e-blast. Do you want to talk about uh, the outreach to, that the membership committee is launching? Hold oh, on, let me grab her real quick. Is she okay. still on? She was on. I'm probably catching her off guard because I didn't ask her to prepare, but uh, Ozzy, I can see. Oh, Ozzy's hands are flailing. Ozzy, did you have a bell ringer? You have to take yourself off mute, my friend. There you go, Ozzy. You got to click the unmute button. Click your microphone. Not, I can't hear you yet. Okay. Okay, I can't, just a second, don't give up. Just try your microphone button one more time. Bottom left-hand corner, Ozzy, you should have a little microphone. There you go, now oh, I can see okay, that you're not I got it, okay. Okay, this must be worth a lot of money. Go for it, Ozzy. I have a $75 Bell ringer for the privilege of announcing an idea for you to think about fellow Rotarians. $75 is the five times $15 of lunch money I save by doing this on TV instead of going to the conference center. And I'm going to do that every, for the rest of the time we're doing this. If we were all doing that, we'd raise over a thousand dollars each meeting for the Salem Rotary Fund. So, I encourage you to give that some thought. Thank you. Okay, so how many times do you want me to ring the bell, Oz? Four or just, five? Just once. Just once, okay. Thank you, Oz. Okay, excellent. Is, is there anybody else we're missing and did we find Robin while we were? We did. Robin okay. Tricky went under our Kerner, but you are okay. being unmuted, Robin, so prepare okay. yourself. Robin, do you have interest in making an announcement about the membership committee outreach? Um, sure, I can. Let me just hold on. Family, I'm on, so no talking for just a second. Um, uh, yeah, so we thought it was really important that we reached out to everybody um, who wasn't able to join us for the first couple weeks, just to make sure that they knew first that we were meeting, and second, they had everything that they needed so that the um, all of their you know needs were being met. If anybody needed any groceries or anything, we wanted to make it really um, we wanted to make sure that they knew that we would help them if they needed anything. And then also to let them know that if they needed support when it came to technology and things like that with logging on or video, that we were happy to help too because we really want everybody to be able to join us, especially with this being our new normal and this probably going to be around for a while. So um, now that we're going to be taking attendance, it's important that everybody has the ability to log on. Great. Thanks, Robin. Appreciate sure. that. Appreciate the outreach from the committee. I, I yeah. don't want any of our members to feel shut in or disconnected. So thank you for taking yeah. that on. Sure. Uh, is, are there any other announcements for the good of the order? I wanna be sure I don't miss anyone. You can put your physical hand in the air as I scroll through the my screens or we can, um, you can put it in the chat or you can put your um, hand up on the participants list as well. 
Okay, so I don't see any other indications. Brenna, am I missing anyone? Nope, good. Okay, all right. So now uh, Warren Benars is our program chair and we'll move to the introduction of our program. So Warren, please take it away. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's nice to see you all again. Um, today we have Michael Roth, who's going to be speaking to us about the surviving the COVID-19 in the retail food business. Um, and I thought it would be nice to have a head table, a virtual head table. So I've asked three people to sit at the head table today. The first one being Elise Bauman. And yes, Elise, I will get you those uh, the elastic this afternoon. I'll drop it <laughs> off at Mary Book Food Share. Anyway, Elise is the uh, executive director for Salem Harvest and is currently on the front lines of supplying those who need food in our community during this pandemic. Uh, the second person that I chose was Scott Larson. Uh, I see Scott frequently at Ross uh, I IGA in the, the um, uh, what is it? Vista, Vista Ross IGA. Anyway, uh, Scott is in the retail management and uh, is also in the front line of uh, the community. And the third person I chose was Selma Pierce. She's a retired dentist who is running for House District 20 and our past first citizen, along with her husband, Bud Pierce, Dr. Bud Pierce. She's also a red badger, hence the reason for my invitation for her to come on to the head table today. So hopefully this will get her blue badge sooner. <laughs> so on with that, I will say the bio for Michael Roth. Uh, Michael started in the freight stocking crew in 1979 has, and has worked throughout the business to develop a comprehensive understanding of the grocery business. He was the marketing director of the Sunny Slope, Lancaster, and West Salem markets and became president in 1996. Roth reinvests its profit to maintain a state of the art fresh markets. Two new successful initiatives include the very popular made to order fresh grill in store restaurants and the very popular Roths to go where customers can shop remotely with their computers and phones, buying everything available in the physical store and pick up their complete orders in designated Roths to go loading spots in the store parking lots. So with that, let's say hello and give a warm uh, clap to uh, Michael Ross. <laughs> Well, good, good, good. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and uh, thank you, Allison and Bruce, for your very nice comments. Um, around the end of March, my cell phone rang, and I answered it. It was my neighbor, Warren Benars, and Warren asked me, would you, would you talk to the downtown Rotary and explain why no toilet paper? And I said, well, well, what I wanted to say to Warren was, Warren, I'm just a little busy dealing with the first worldwide pandemic in 102 years. But what I did say was, I'd love to. I've always admired everything about Salem's downtown Rotary. So welcome from North Salem. You're zooming into the main office of Ross Fresh Markets. I've been a speaker at grocery events throughout my life and normally I memorize my presentations and go without notes. And I am sincerely apologizing, but my pea-sized brain is completely numb after these last 35 years in the retail food business. But in spite of never working harder and never dealing with so many supply and HR issues caused by this pandemic, I can assure you everyone on the Ross team is extremely proud of keeping our stores functioning for our customers during these very challenging times. My presentation will be split into three topics. Topic number one, I'll share the details on why the US was sold out of toilet paper for a few weeks and will be in short supply for a few months. This made me think, this has to be the very first time that toilet paper has been a topic for the downtown Rotary. Topic number two is the 50-50 calorie split, what grocers call the share of stomach. And topic number three is these three forces interacting. COVID-19, the Center for Disease Control or CDC, and the 650 Roths team members. A quick Rotary related detour. I want to thank you, the downtown Rotary, for honoring our friend, Jerry Frank. Thank you for raising the unbelievable amount of $4 million to build the soon to be amazing Salem Rotary Jerry Frank Amphitheater. A recent quick Jerry story. Pre-COVID, 
my wife, Leslie, and I would go to dinner with Jerry twice a month. We were his wheels to get him to his favorite Chinese restaurant, Hunan Pearl in Tiger. I'm guessing most of you know Jerry and his personality, so you'll enjoy how this ends. At the end of another great dinner, we were given our customary fortune cookies. Jerry opened up his cookie and with my left hand on a figurative Bible, his fortune cookie read these three words, you're a perfectionist. Whoever made this batch of fortune cookies got that cookie exactly right. My only regret was not framing the you're a perfectionist in a little two inch by three inch frame and adding this memento to everything that's on the walls at Jerry's office. It just doesn't seem right to talk about surviving COVID in the grocery business without thanking, honoring, and elevating the most important group of people, the men and women who have been putting on the masks and gowns and going into the intensive care unit at Salem Hospital. They're working tirelessly to give people a chance struggling with this terrible disease. Now let's get into the details about the number one topic, toilet paper. Why is it so hard to re reliably find toilet paper at a grocery store these days? Focus on this number, 141, 141. That is the annual usage per person of rolls of toilet paper in the United States. There are around 150 factories in the US that collectively make those 141 rolls per person per year. If those factories, instead of making 141 rolls, only made 140 rolls per person per year, or not enough, that last week of December would not be too pleasant. If those 150 factories, instead of making 141 rolls per person, made 142 rolls per person per year, at the end of the year, with 325 million people in the US, there would be an additional 325 million unused single rolls of toilet paper looking for a home. That excess would have to be stored in massive warehouses that would incur hefty storage fees. Toilet paper is a commodity with very slim margins, definitely not high enough margins to pay storage fees. So what are the numbers that explain what happened March 12th to March 19th to toilet paper sales and what we at Roths internally call the end of the world panic sale. Let's go back to the 141 rolls per person per year. Dividing the 141 rolls by 12 months, that is roughly 12 rolls a month usage. On a micro level, you have 12 people. I'll call these people persons A, B, C, D, and E. Normally person A would walk, would buy 12 rolls each month, their exact monthly needs. But person A panicked on March 12th and bought 60 rolls or five times his or her monthly needs. Later that day, people B, C, D, and E all walked into empty store shelves as person A had already bought what those 150 factories had made that month for people A, B, C, D, and E. So on a macro level, group A hoarded toilet paper and groups B, C, D, and E are still, are still without. A side note, if there was a speculator who was willing to buy those 325 million excess rolls I talked about earlier and pay year after year storage fees and wait years or decades for a pandemic or earthquake with hopes of making a huge speculative profit, it wouldn't happen easily. When panics happen, governments invoke price gouging laws and this speculator would be under tremendous government scrutiny as well as terrible PR. Remember a minute ago, I pointed out that there weren't huge warehouses of excess TP. So until more TP is produced by those 150 factories, supplies will be very limited. We did receive two semi-fulls of toilet paper over the last 20 days. So twice we've sold toilet paper on a limited basis to our customers, customers B, C, D, and E, the customers without a nine roll package just to get them by. We also have been able to get a hold of some odd size packages like this that, that to have some TP on our shelves. This morning I called Scott at the Vista Market and he said we have 16 kinds of various brands of TP. We also have orders in for two more semi trucks and with all the TP factories in production 24 seven, 
We hope to have plenty for all of all your favorite brands soon. The long-term answer for everyone to never worry about panic buyers clearing store shelves before you get there is to listen to SIR, which stands for Citizens Emergency Response Team. CERT's mission is to get the public through panics and natural disasters by having you and your neighbors, when supplies are plentiful, purchase and keep a, a few months of supply of key items in your house at all time. CERT will tell you when the water pipes are all broken, streets are destroyed, power lines are everywhere, and grocery stores are closed for repairs because of the potential 7.8 magnitude Cascadia earthquake, you will only live three days without water. I drink CERT's Kool-Aid. In addition to keeping 10 cases of bottled water, I also keep a tall stack of 18-pack AngelSoft TP that Ross sells in my garage. Because of my stash, I was able to play Santa Claus and hand out TP to my friends in need, dire, dire need, this last month. If downtown Rotary hasn't had a presentation by a certain instructor, let me know. We donate meeting rooms to CERT at the West Salem Ross, and I know them well and can make an introduction. Toilet paper wasn't the only product that was being bought completely out. Pre-COVID, pre-COVID now, the grocery industry was all about fresh foods, all about foods with little or no labor to prepare. Most people were too busy to cook complicated meals with multiple ingredients. Contrast that to the end of the world sale. Again, that period from Thursday, March 12th through Wednesday, March 19th. Our sales that week were three times normal. That's right, three times normal. In, a, in addition to paper products, other areas of the store com, were completely empty. That week, it was all about buying shelf-stable ingredients. If people were going to be home for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, possibly unable to leave their homes, after they filled up the refrigerator and filled up their freezer, their mentality was better fill up the pantry as well. With weeks at home and nothing but time, they also wanted to cook complicated recipes from scratch. For example, I helped a customer find dry yeast. She hadn't bought yeast in years and her quote was, if I'm gonna be at home, I wanna make my grandma's scratch bread recipe. I haven't baked a recipe in over 10 years and wanted a project to do. Next, my red dot thought. It was late in the evening, the first Sunday, of the end of the world sale. I was in the West Hamlet store pulling the few remaining cans and boxes to the front of the shelf just so the shelves wouldn't look quite so empty. I got to the canned chili section and most everything was empty except Hormel Completes. They were untouched. Not one had sold. I of course got on the phone and called our grocery buyer and said, I'm gonna put, oh, my red, my red pen just fell, but imagine my red pen on anything that not even one person would buy, not even the end of the world sale. If they wouldn't buy these products during these last four days, they aren't gonna buy them in the future. So Hormel completes and about 400 other items are on their way out. Now let's talk about sales of spam. I picked a shelf stable item that we all grew up eating, but most of us completely avoid now. Canned gelatin meat, and as I faintly remember, with not the best smell when you open it up. During the last seven days of the end of the world sale, again, March 12th through the 19th, nine Roth stores sold 283, cran 283 cans of Spam, and we might have sold 283 more cans of Spam if we hadn't run out after a few days. To show you the difference in buying habits during the pre-COVE panic, those exact same days last year in 2019, we only sold 22 total cans of Spam in nine stores. So even, with, so even with every store selling out early during the end of the world sale, that's an incredible 851% sales, sales increase that week from 2019 to 2020. Today, if you walk into a grocery store and you see empty shelves, it's not because grocers want to be out of stock. We are unbelievably frustrated to get products wholesale, to get products. Wholesalers are still out of many items, and that means we're both out until more is manufactured. And not to start any more panic buying, but more and more production plants are shutting down due to many of their workers testing positive for COVID, especially in the meat industry. You will continue to see popular products be, being completely out due to production. Topic number two, the 50-50 calorie split. Pre-COVID, across the U.S., Grocery stores supplied 50% of the nation's calories 
and restaurants supplied 50% of the nation's calories. Monday, March 16th, Governor Brown closed all restaurants and bars. It went from grocers supplying 50% of the calories to now grocers supplying 95% of the calories with restaurants and drive throughs and takeout menus maybe supplying the last 5%. Your question might be, why don't you hire more people? We have hired about 10% more. Many of them college students had, who had worked at Ross before but were home early when their schools were canceled. But we know the restaurants will, will reopen maybe as early as May 25th and we'll go back to sharing the calories 50-50. Now, topic number three, we've talked about the product shortages, we've talked about grocery store businesses up 50%. Now let's talk about who is going to come to work every day. There are three forces interacting here, COVID-19 disease, the CDC, and the 650 Roth team members. The 650 team members constantly hear the COVID statistics on their TVs, their radios, news websites, and newspapers. It's nonstop. Today's new COVID cases, the new total COVID case, the new total of all COVID cases, and even worse, the daily deaths from COVID, and even worse yet, the total deaths from COVID. Not at all helpful to motivate people to come to work in a grocery store. We trace our success of getting our teamers to be so dedicated to their customers and that they keep coming to work every day because of this. Sanitizer. Pre-COVID, we had bottles of sanitizer. For years, we've had bottles of sanitizer at every checkout. And we heard about the first case in the US, we took that one bottle in, for the customer at the checkouts, up to 70 bottles in each store. You only see about half the bottles on the retail side. The other half is in every backroom space, every office, every delivery vehicle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, as a bottle to a sanitizer. We refill these 70 bottles per store from pallets of those two gallon jugs of sanitizer we jumped on and bought before the first COVID death in the US. Our message has been, and Scott can tell you, here's it every day, use the sanitizer constantly as much as you want, even between customers, as we have enough sanitizer to outlast this pandemic. Also, we gave the stores extra labor, not included in their penal budgets, to clean and sanitize the stores every day. So everything was good except this. Our cash were, cashiers were two feet from the face of their customers. You gotta get within two feet to pass the cash. How would the grocery industry solve this dilemma? I do remember this clearly. One of the later Wednesdays in March, I was watching Survivor one evening with my wife on the couch, and it's happened a lot this last month, had fallen asleep on the couch. Leslie and my daughter screamed when they're, at night, about nine, Leslie and my daughter screamed when their favorite player was voted off. It woke me up, and I woke up to this thought. Plexiglass, used sheets of plexiglass to put up and make a physical barrier between the cashier and the customer. That next day, the minute the plexiglass store opened, we bought 85 sheets and started installing plexiglass at every check stand. We were possibly the first grocery in the US to use plexiglass as a barrier, and we have gotten nothing but compliments and thanks from both cashiers and customers. And if I'd have had time to patent it, my next Zoom would have been from Fiji to the downtown Rotary with, with my, uh, my new company. But now every grocer, most every grocer has plexiglass now. Anyway. I found this sign one evening at one of our stores taped to the plexiglass facing the customer. It's hard to read on the screen, but pretend you are the customer and I'll read what you would have read. Please do not tap the glass. Our ca cashiers are easily frightened. Thank you. All these extra steps have taken, uh, we have taken, are noticed by people coming in the markets, like Bruce mentioned. About a week ago, 30 days into COVID, a customer who I was talking to in the parking lot at Vista said this quote to me, I like coming to the Vista store because it feels so clean. Way to go, Scott Larson, the market director at Vista and a member of your Rotary. I told you we follow the CDD's, CDC's recommendations even when they decide to make a 180 degree change on previous recommendations. In early April, the CDC said healthy people do not need to wear masks. Okay. 
Then six days later, the CDD said people in potential close public contact need to wear cloth masks. Okay. We went to order 650 masks and found out we would get them mid-May. That's not okay. We wanted to follow the CDC, so we paid three seamstresses, and I guess we could have hired Warren, to sew us 650 masks. This is where it has been interesting with the public through this crisis. The day after the CDC said the public needed to wear masks, cloth masks, and it was impossible to get them sewn in one day, we got some negative emails, comments, saying, Ross, you aren't following the CDC guidelines on masks. Those really hurt, as we truly have been trying our very best. When the CC CDC did their 180 degree change on cloth masks, it would have been nice if they had said to the public, give these hardworking retailers a few days to procure the very hard to find cloth masks. Oh well. The crisis has made us stop and think about the worst case. In putting plans together to pass out these cloth masks, I said, what happens if one of these seamstresses was asymptomatic and through every mask, they touched, infected an entire store. So we required that every team member make, take their new mask home and wash it before wearing, and now we are 100% on masks. I promise you some insights on your e-blast of other steps we've taken, in case you have to go through a pandemic. We have a daily 9.15 a.m. COVID conference call with the top 30, including Scott, people across all the stores and people in our office. We talk through the, the latest CDC announcements, other new COVID developments. I don't know if you heard today, but now they're going to allow us to, uh, uh, grocers can now go to the front of the line to get testing, which is a positive thing, and other supply issues. We also talk about, ha we also have a daily 1115 call with a smaller group of HR and our labor attorney. We discuss any new CDC guidance that affect labor law and work through HR issues with the federal and state leave laws. These programs and issues make HR issues just too complicated during COVID without daily legal advice. Now let's go way, way back to Sunday, March 14th. Three days had passed into the end of the world sale and every, everyone in the stores were beyond exhausted after working very long days because of three time normal sales. That Sunday it popped in my head to thank the team for being exhausted and yet still coming to work with some type of extra pay during these unprecedented times. That next Monday, that next day on Monday, I said to HR, let's pay a $2 per hour premium and let's call it the thank you premium. Since March 12th, we've paid over $242,000 in thank you premiums, $2 at an hour, $3 for overtime, it's labor attorneys on the phone, or the, to these extremely dedicated team members and, and just announced that the thank you pay will continue for the rest of April and into May. A week later, when after we started, we found out our main competitor was also paying the same $2 per hour and calling it hazard pay. Not sure if that was the best name for a program designed to motivate people to come to work. I did want to share a few stories. The entire city was out of EP. Hundreds of customers, and Scott could attest to this, were calling the stores daily, asking the same question, do you have any toilet paper? After many, many calls, the Lancaster store started answering their phone like this. Thank you for calling the Ross and Lancaster. We are sorry, but we are out of toilet paper. The next sound they heard was click and a dial tone on four out of five calls. Next, I saw Anna Peterson, who is, on, is attending today, and I knew she was a downtown Rotarian. I told her I was doing a Zoom about the TP shortage and needed something interesting to add in. Anna said, with all the stay-at-home orders, with all the stay-at-home orders, the March 2020 great TP shortage might turn into the December 2020 great diaper shortage. I said, good point. I'll make a note and we'll order extra diapers for December. Hold on just a second here. I'm just getting a text in. Um, it's a text. I, I'm signed up for, to get these uh, uh, emergency um, alerts from the CDC. I should take a glance. Is look, look at to see if it's important. I think oh, I'm going to read it. For immediate release, April 22nd, 
emergency alert from the Center for Disease Control. With the majority of U.S. citizens under stay-at-home orders for these past 30 days, and with not much for anyone to do except eat, eat, and then eat some more, the CDC recommends everyone immediately start six feet social distancing from your refrigerator. Thank you for your attention. One more thing to share, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I end up every, lastly, I end up every presentation I do with this. Every morning, we have a choice. That day, we can choose to be a fountain, or we can choose to be a drain. Drains sap energy. Drains diminish. Drains take away. Fountains are just the opposite. Fountains flow positivity and goodness. Fountains gush, gush optimism and a can-do attitude. When you think of Roth's Fresh Markets, my hope is you think of us as a fountain of goodness in the Salem community. Thank you for your time today. That's all there is. Okay, see y'all. I'm leaving. No, no, no. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, I've always wanted, I've always wanted to do this, and it, you have to be about 60 to get this reference. But I grew up in the 70s. I used to watch Portland wrestling on Saturday night, and there was a retailer called Top Peterson's in Portland. And so in case any of you fell asleep, I've always wanted to do this. I'm going to go, wake up, wake up, yep. wake up, yep. wake up, wake yep. up. So if you're under 60, that reference means nothing, but maybe one or few, two might have enjoyed that. So I yep. answer any questions, but only if they're easy. So go ahead, people. And Brenna, I see Ron Kellerman. Is he first in the queue? Okay, yep. Ron. Take it away. Thank you so much, Michael, for being a fountain, uh, not only today, but uh, throughout the years. And I dare say, I don't think any other uh, CEO or manager of any other food retailer in Salem would bother to respond to a request to speak before us. So thank you for doing that. Well, and I will you. say it is a joy. I was at Ross Vista today. Your shelves are well stocked, except maybe for some baking items. And uh, but I found baking powder, and um, everybody is cheerful and happy, and it wasn't crowded, and it's just overall a very nice experience. And there was hand sanitizer right by the peanut butter and uh, almond butter machine. Thank you. Oh, good. Yeah, that's one of the seventies. Thank you. Thanks for noticing. Very nice. Thank you. And Syrah, you're next in the queue. <clears throat> And I unmuted you. Now I think you have to unmute yourself. Okay. I, I have unmuted myself, I think. Have I? Yes. yes. You're good. Um, I'd just like to say I have never been a fan of, of these services where you contact the store, you order online, and you go and pick it up. But this time, obviously, times have changed. And we had to do it. And I said, well, you know, if, if anybody's going to be able to do this, it's probably Roth's. So I put in my order, and I really love to cook. So I'm not, I'm not a dry bean and spam person. I'm the kind of person ordering things like fennel and rhubarb and extra virgin olive oil. <laughs> and I was so impressed when I got our first order. You got, I got everything but rhubarb. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it you. was a $200 order. It was a big one, and it was fantastic. <laughs> And your staff were fantastic bringing it to the car. It's just, it's, in fact, now we're, we're ordering every week. And we appreciate the fact that you're adding more slots. We shop at the McMinnville store, by the way. And it's just a tremendous service. And we are very, very grateful. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's excellent. Great feedback. Thank you, Ann. Uh, let's see. Who else is in the queue? Brenna, do you see anyone else in the queue? Ron, did, did, you actually, did you have a question that we didn't get to ask? Yes, I have a follow-up question. A follow-up, okay. So um, I'm just curious, Michael, about all of the uh, food waste that might be going on now. It, it seemed like the, the fish department was um, pretty slow today, and I, I just see an awful lot of fresh produce and stuff. Uh, how much of that ends up in landfills or elsewhere? You know, that's a great question. Um, normally, uh, and Rick could tell you, we try to ship everything to them um, uh, that we can. 
and uh, every store has a relationship with the local food, food bank. So the, the food, anything that's close dated, out of date, goes to the food bank. Then, you know, the tripping charges in all areas are great. Tripping charges is what they charge you to empty your dumpster. So grocers try to find uh, pig farmers, and there's farmers that pick up uh, all of the food waste. Obviously, um, I don't know. I think that I think in Salem they actually pick up meat. Is that I don't know. Scott can't answer, but we we you know our goal would be that nothing, everything would go to the needy, and nothing would go into the dumpsters. Um, we do our best. Um, you know, they get, the, the stores get really good at ordering, so I'm guessing not a lot goes in. We call it the bone barrel. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but, um, you know, in a perfect world, a grocery would have absolutely zero waste. You know, we'd recycle all the paper, we'd recycle all the plastic, all the food would either go to the food bank or the pig farmers or, or uh, uh, I think Marion County now takes some of it in. And, and turns vegetable products into dirt. So I guess hopefully that answers your question. I can tell you dairy farmers are re very appreciative of your uh, vegetables and produce uh, that come to them. The cows love it and so thank you. But it thank keeps you. it out of the landfill. Um, next in line, I think we have, is it Rick Galpo? Is that right, Brenna? Okay, Rick, it's- Yeah, and I, unmute, I'm, I unmuted both Rick and Scott in case you guys want to chime in to anything that Michael just said, so. Okay, oh. so Rick and Scott, you're uh, not on mute. Well, first, thank you so much. And um, uh, Ross has been a great partner at the Food Share. Um, and just to provide some background, right when COVID response happened, uh, we suspended our pickups from retail stores, um, partly because they were slammed and partly because we were trying to understand our own social distancing. And we're now trying to go back and talk about how do we do this safely uh, for um, both the food share and for uh, all store staff. Um, so we're, we're beginning those conversations again and stores have been a great partner and Ross has been an amazing partner. Um, okay. Yeah, you, you guys are amazing. Um, can you tell me how you think the, um, uh, the federal purchasing of food is going to affect supply lines. So one thing that, that's so interesting right now is um, uh, obviously many, many people are very concerned about who's going to be hungry and, and, and the increased need for food banks. Um, and so the federal government is actually purchasing a lot more food. In fact, it will be a, it will be a um, only about 15, sorry, I will get to my question. Uh, only about 15% of our food in general comes from federal support. It's, it's vast, uh, much more comes from local retail stores. Um, but right now we're in a weird mix. And I was just wondering how you were uh, projecting um, food purchasing um, and how that's even going to, how federal purchasing is going to compete against store purchasing. I was wondering how, you, how you're getting your head around that. Uh, you know, I'm just not an expert on that. I mean, you know, uh, I, I've just briefly followed that uh, the federal government is trying to buy uh, a lot of cheese because, um, well, here's a good example. Our pro Since day one, our produce departments have looked, there's a magazine called Progressive Grocer. If they're going to come to your market, you're, everything's perfect and take pictures. So from day one of this whole thing, our produce has looked fantastic because if I, because where we buy our produce, half their business is from grocery stores. Us, a group of markets in Seattle and a group in Spokane, the other half of their business was all restaurants. And so they lost half their business. So we've had zero problem getting any kind of produce, right? So I'm guessing their, some of their food might have been going to food banks. I'm not sure. Um, like at one point, basically, they would give you partially because – you know, they just, had, restaurants normally bought it. They had parsley, said, hey, have some parsley. But anyway, um, so, and then now with the dairy business, you know, when they made a decision, and I know uh, ten, the, the, your president is in the yeah. dairy industry, when they shut all the schools down, that immediately shut down a huge percentage of the milk that was being consumed in the United States. And so I believe right now there's a pretty severe glut of milk and so the government, federal government stepping in to, you know, rather than you, we all saw the news where people were putting it in their fields. Now they're making it into cheese. 
and then they're obviously going to put it in, you know, the, the government's the one place that probably does have warehouses and warehouses full of toilet paper. I mean, they're, they're the only entity that doesn't have the, the, you know, so in case there was, there was a major earthquake, they would, they would drop Huey helicopters at some, I mean, you should still try to, I mean, I hope out of this, everybody st keeps a stack of toilet paper in your garage. But if you're not inclined to do that, the day's going to be where they're going to drop Huey helicopters and they're going to drop pallets of water and pallets of toilet paper in parking lots just to keep society from rioting. Well, anyway, they probably have huge warehouses that I, I know they have huge warehouses full of cheese that they're going to get into the hands of people like your organization. I just don't know as far as the pricing, what it will do. Um, you know, we're under pretty strict uh, anti-gouging laws. So even though there's massive, you know, in, 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 a, perf, in, a, in, a, in a laissez fair environment, prices would raise, see, if there was a shortage of toilet paper, we would never do this. But if there was a shortage of toilet paper in a laissez fair economic environment, everybody that owns toilet paper would raise the price so only the people that really need it would pay that price well you know with price controls that doesn't happen so we you know we just we had to sell the toilet which we did we obviously we would have we sold it for the same price that we did the day before but you know but so that's the reason shortages occur but you know i i just not an expert on that plus honestly i get off i mean out wheeling the vista like Five fifty, five, you know, five thirty-six. Work all day. All these crazy phone calls. I get home. I watch the channel two, ABC News, and I'm snoring by about six thirty. So I, I just, I really haven't done a lot of reading. I, I'm just happy to. I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> Michael, so, I, we I so happy, Michael, we're happy to have Ross and happy to have you with us today. Uh, and we are getting really super great feedback. That's the good thing about virtual meetings is you have this opportunity for a chat room and all of the feedback from participants from attendees today is that this is one of the best programs we've had all year. So thank you, Michael, for being with us today. We do have time for just one more question and then we are- Hey, I got it. can I say one more thing? Argel, we do have an induction today. I'm sorry, that's a little bit out of order, but we're going to induct a new member. So we have time for just one more short question. If there's someone who hasn't asked a question and if you'd like to put your hand in the air and let it, let Brenna and I know that you have a question, we'd love to hear your question. The Deckelman, I think, is is uh, has a question that embodies a lot of what some of the other questions I'm getting um, privately. Except are. I think David left the meeting. No, I'm here. The participant box. No, there he is. Okay, David, it's you. I just, uh, yeah, we were just discussing at home. Has Michael heard anything about any sort of other looming food shortages? Certainly the pork producers have been in the news lately, but, um, you know, is there any other segments of the market that are unable to produce for demand? It's a great question. It's going to be the, mostly in the protein market, and here's the reason why. Um, like up in Pasco area, there's huge facilities, and they hire people, and they work on these long tables, and they work shoulder to shoulder. Now, this is all going to change, but, you know, show, you know, these people that own these factories were just basically praying that nobody, one person would get COVID because they were working side by side. And, these long, and they were cutting up beef and cutting up, you know, chicken. And Well, it just was announced today that the foster plant up in uh, Longview, I think, had a, a COVID case. And the environment that those plants work in is not conducive to social distancing. So they, um, you know, you're probably going to see it mostly in protein. Um, one thing about the pro, you know, whether it's our stores or Fred's or whatever, there's not shelf tags on those cases. So if you sell out a one kind of meat, you just basically slide the other stuff over. It's kind of a trick. I'm giving you the tricks here. I shouldn't be giving you all our little tricks, but uh, um, so, you know, you in, in, in a meat environment, you probably won't notice unless you really like, I only want to buy Hebrew national hot dogs and I won't buy anything else. You'll go to pick those up and they, you know, if that plant has a COVID issue, and it spreads between those workers and they, you know, it doesn't mean just those workers, then they got to quarantine the people that don't have, you know, symptoms. So it, it, it snowballs pretty fast. So I would say protein um, will be a, a big thing. My, 
for a couple of days, my wife, Leslie, who's the best, she was coming in and helping pick grocery orders. Cause we, you know, I was just so frustrated. I said, we got to get to a maximum two days lead time on these orders. So we, Scott can tell you, we just basically had a Marshall plan to get those orders from seven weeks down to two. And uh, my wife was helping pick frozen vegetables. And she said, you know, it's our brand, it's essential every day. And she goes, they're all out. And we've been through, at this point, we've been through, probably, Scott could probably say, probably 15 order cycles of frozen vegetables. And I said, I said, darling, think about it. You're not gonna get any more frozen broccoli until the broccoli crop is repicked. And then that stuff is frozen. You know, so you're going to have things that, you know, because of this panic buying. So I ran into a customer and I won't say in the store, I was taking, you know, helping people the first few days and they went to a big box retailer in town and they were sold out of freezers. And people thought that there might, and this is, I, w I was helping a friend of mine, uh, we we're doing this project and we had to make sure there was no gas tanks in the ground. And so I was the guy that was doing that work. He, he, he got a text from his buddy in the Philippines. They put martial law in. In other words, if you stepped outside of your house, they, they could shoot you. So, and I, I think in the back of some people's mind, they just thought it might come to that, you know? And so people just bought crazy. They went over, bought a brand new freezer, plugged it into their garage. And uh, so, you know, they, they you know, there, there's a, you know, you're not, you're just, there's some things that are gonna be out until the new crop especially in frozen foods until that new crop is harvested and some canned vegetables. You're going to see a lot of, well, um, you know, you're going to see a lot of canned vegetables that are just going to be out until the new crop comes in. So. Okay, Michael, thank you very much. Let's show Michael how much we appreciate his presentation today. This yeah. was it's absolutely fabulous. And Michael, yesterday when we did the walkthrough, I know you were feeling like you were not, this was not your place to be and that you were going to be, um, not providing us a very good program, but this has been very solid, absolutely timely. We needed to hear from you. We needed that first person point of and perspective. So thank you very, very much for bringing us current on your world and how it's been to function in this time where we have, none of us could have expected to have to experience, but thank you so much for your perspective. We really appreciate you, sir. And we appreciate your partnership with the amphitheater and all the support that you have given us along the way during our fundraising. So thank you, sir. Oh, I'm going to say one more thing. Okay. Now, you, you, I think some of you know Jerry Frank personally. And Jerry, his whole life, and I call him every day, or he calls me. If I don't call him by about 8.30, he's going to call me, so I just jump on it. That guy has been the center of everything for 96 years. And poor Jerry is, he can't go to his office. And he's not getting invited to, I mean, he'll go to Portland three nights a week for meetings and he'll have one or two in Salem. So anyway, what I'm trying to say here is if you know Jerry on a social level, pick up your, as soon as you're done with this meeting, and don't mention, don't mention it. I reached out to, through Janet Taylor to uh, Terry Tumchuk. And I said, Carrie, you got to email everybody that you know in Portland to call Jerry and call him because that guy, he's about ready to, I mean, he's 96 years old, and he's just so lonely at his house. So any of you that know him personally, call him on his cell phone and cheer him up. And don't tell him we had this conversation. Just say, Jerry, I just started thinking about you. I can't wait to see your amphitheater. Just, I mean, don't, don't let him in on, the, okay. on this little thing, because he's, okay. he, he's a social person, and he has nobody to talk to. Excellent. We'll, we will do that. Thank you, Michael, for that recommendation. Okay, now we need to move into the uh, last part of our business. Ryan it, Collier is going to introduce a new member to us. So Ryan, please introduce Kelsey. Uh, thank you, President Tammy and fellow Rotarians. It is my uh, honor to be able to welcome and introduce you to our newest Rotarian, uh, Kelsey Balde. Uh, she is a born and raised uh, Salemite. Uh, she is currently the marketing and PR director for Dodie Pruitt Wilson, uh, CPAs here in town. Uh, she uh, grew up in Southside Salem and uh, went to Shirley Elementary, Crossler Middle School, I think, and Sprague High School. She studied uh, voice performance at Western Oregon, uh, then uh, went to University of Oregon, majored in English literature and a minor in voice performance. Graduated from there in 2010. 
Uh, she began, uh, she got her first flavor for PR and by the way, was I was unmuted that whole time, right? I don't have to restate that, right? You're good. You're good. Okay, good. Shoot. Yeah, oh, man. Good. So, uh, but she got her start in the PR and marketing world. You know, obviously, she studied voice performance, and that was what she did. But she uh, was the kitchen a manager for a kitchen store. And so she had to do all the PR and the marketing and the finance. And so worked her way through uh, various positions in marketing and PR. Well, Dodie Pruitt-Wilson was looking for uh, a PR marketing person that also understood the intricacies of finance. Well, she now has her dream job. So she's very happy there. In her spare time, uh, she does like to uh, flip antiques. I don't think she means physically flip them in the air. I think she means actually find a little treasure, uh, an antique, refurbish it and resell it. That's what she means. Uh, but that's one of her loves. Uh, but an interesting thing happened uh, in romance. And this is a really wonderful story. Uh, she met uh, the love of her life through uh, online dating. Uh, she found uh, Sharif, uh, a, a person from uh, the West African country of Guinea who is here on a soccer scholarship. And they fell in love uh, online, uh, became married two years ago. They have an eight month old named Max that takes up a significant amount of their extra time. Uh, Sharif uh, from West Africa uh, has a, his family obviously and eight brothers and sisters uh, are there and his mom uh, actually owns a market in Guinea. Uh, dad uh, owns various real estate. He, his first language is French. Her first language is English. So they're enjoying uh, learning each other's languages uh, at the same time. But uh, they both understand the language of love. Welcome, uh, Kelsey Balde. It's a pleasure to have you uh, in our Rotary. Tammy, take it away. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Kelsey, it's great to see your beautiful smiling face. Thank you, Ryan, for introducing Kelsey Balde into membership in our club. Involving people who will continue to build this great club and giving them a place to belong is a top priority. To show our appreciation, the club will award you, Ryan, 250 Paul Harris points towards your next fellowship. Kelsey, through your membership in Rotary, you can build lifelong friendships and join forces with like-minded like people around the world who desire to make a difference in their communities. Our club is comprised of leaders who embrace our motto, service above self. As Rotarians, we have pledged to uphold the highest ethical standards, subscribe to the object of Rotary, and live by the four-way test. Regular attendance to our weekly meetings is an important part of your membership, but Rotary is much more than just a club. As you become more involved and you will begin to understand the power of Rotary through expanded friendships and involvement in your choice of many committees and fellowship activities we offer. As you build friendships and contribute to our impact here and around the world, you will truly understand what it means to be a member of this club and the 1.2 million Rotarians worldwide. We are a vibrant action oriented club and as such, we know you will roll up your sleeves and get involved. Therefore, Kelsey, as the newest member of our club, do you pledge to uphold the four-way test, to serve on at least two committees, and to contribute to the club in every way that you can? I do. And fellow Rotarians, do you pledge to warmly welcome Kelsey into our club and to offer her your full support in all that we do? I know we can't hear you, but I know you're saying I do. Please welcome Kelsey as the Rotarian Club of Salem's newest member. Welcome, Kelsey. <laughs> welcome. 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 We're so excited to have welcome. you as a member, Kelsey. Okay. Hey, you're right, hey, Kelsey. Might be a first. Okay, you're all off of mute, so now let's clap for Kelsey and say welcome. Hey. Hey. Yeah. Usually, Kelsey, we would give you a standing ovation, but you can't see us uh, all standing and doing that. So uh, just know we're thrilled to have you join our club. And now you will begin to receive our weekly e-blast. So we're glad to have you and you'll be communicated with regularly. Uh, okay, so one minor addition to the agenda is just to say thank you for Sayla uh, and Karen for joining as guests today. We really appreciate your participation. Uh, we had 85 participants in today's meeting, so I think that's a huge success. And as long as you keep coming along for the ride, we're going to keep taking this ride together every week virtually 
so we can at least see each other's faces and uh, stay connected. So unless you object um, in mass, uh, we are going to continue to meet virtually. Um, I love you all. Blessings to all of you. I miss you. Uh, I can't wait until I can put my arms around you again in a safe, safe distance. Uh, next week's meeting on the 29th will be our very own Jane Downing. So we're going to get Jane's perspective from Center for Hope and Safety. And Russ McCracken, our immediate past president, will serve as our program chair. So if there's nothing else for the good of the order, welcome Kelsey to our membership. Thank you, Ryan, for introducing her. Holly, I believe you've got everybody who's joined. Um, anybody who did join and you, if you are not easily identifiable, uh, please let Holly know or let me know and I'm happy to help you enter your information into DACDB. Take care everybody and I hope to see you soon. Oh, one final little thing. I'm not going to close this meeting right away. If you wanna just chat for a few minutes, I'm happy to do that. I don't have a tight schedule right after the meeting. So go ahead and hang on. If you're interested in Friday night, um, Gathering Fellowship. We're doing a Friday night virtual happy hour at five o'clock. If I don't have you on the list and you want to be on the list, it's a little bit of chaos, but it's fun and it's all in good fun. So um, we do keep it COVID free. So if that's your what's all on your mind, don't join. Um, if you want to just laugh and have a good time and talk and just talk about every everything else, happy to have you. Um, so I think with that, we are adjourned. Love you. <laughs>